The message today is the fight for this generation. Now, I pray that you're able to stay in this sanctuary and listen. Um, and I pray that those who are, um, um, the teen church is, is going to be in here today, by the way. I just wanted to let y'all know just in case uh, there's teens here as well. And so um, the fight for this generation, I would like to speak to you on this message. We as the church have, have our marching orders. We have direction and we have a purpose. But I believe that me, all of us, at one time in our life as a Christian, we forget those marching orders, we forget the purpose, we forget the call of God. And um, I just, I believe that this is a wake up, a reminder for, for all of us this morning. Um, I wanna talk to you today about the youth of this nation about the youth at Grace Christian Center, about the youth that is coming up in this next generation. And you who are older, like me, <laughs> 50 and over, uh, you, you know that time goes by very quickly, amen? And we're not in the middle of our life, we're towards the end of our lives, to be honest with you. I think, uh, you know, if you're gonna live 70, 80 years, then, you know, you're the, the prime of your life was in your 30s. For me, that would have been 20 years ago. And so, uh, I'm on the back end of this life, and praise God, amen? But, you see, as a Christian, what are we leaving to our spiritual children as an inheritance? You see, some of us have children, some of us do not have children. Talk about it in the physical. But as a Christian, we all have spiritual children. And the Lord wants you to be focused on them. A lot of times we cannot focus on our spiritual children, Christian, is because we're too busy being involved in the wrong things. Stumbling over our own habitual lifestyle of sin. Knowing what we ought to do, but not doing it. And therefore, we pay the price with bad health, physically and spiritually. This should not be. You see the generation today. It is becoming more and more corrupt. And our spiritual children, who are little right now, if the Lord tarries and doesn't come anytime soon, what are they going to inherit in this world? Let, let me tell you what they will inherit for sure. A world that will be more evil than it is today. You think the world is bad right now in regards to evil? If the Lord tarries and does not come anytime soon, what will this world look like in 20 years from now? What did the world look like 20, 30 years ago? That cannot even compare to what we're dealing with today. And so as a Christian, you have to get the mindset of the future. Though we are only understanding that we are only guaranteed one day at a time, but at the same time, we are called to leave an inheritance. And as a spiritual father, as a spiritual mother, as a Christian, we have spiritual children, and we are to leave an inheritance to them. What we sow into the kingdom of God right now on this earth will bless those children in their future when they are adults, when they become elders. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now we're going to talk about our school this morning. We're going to talk about the youth this morning. We're going to talk about what God wants us to do, I believe, in the very, very near future here at Grace Christian Center. But I also believe that this is for a message for every church in America. You train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is not just a charge to the parent. This is a charge to the Christian, period. Because Christians, all of you, have an influence in the life of the youth, in the life of this generation. All of you Christians, all of you. All of you. Get that through our heads today. Get that into our hearts today. You are an influence to this next generation. This is so serious let me back this up with scripture. Matthew 18, 2 through 7. Setting this up. Jesus called the little child to him and put the child among them. 
And then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? Now, Christian, you are an influence to every youth. What you do in your life in regards to your time, your talent, and your treasure, these kids are watching. And it will either propel them into the life of faith or it will stumble them to, 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 fall, to sin and fall and to deny Jesus in their latter years. You are to be the godly example in their life. You need to teach them to pray. You need to teach them to trust in the Lord. And you need to teach them what it means to be a giver. A giver. One who is not a taker, but a giver. We're going to go deep this morning. Because there is much, there is much to be said. Jesus says, what sorrow awaits, awaits the world? Because the judgment of God is coming upon this world. And we cannot raise up a generation of youth like the world is raising it up. We have to be holy. We have to be separate. We have to be bold. We have to be confident in the word of God. And we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit to understand the will of God for the generations. I think of Daniel and his three friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were young men ready to serve. In the book of Daniel, they were probably in their teens. Most likely they were in their teens when King Nebuchadnezzar came into Israel and took all of Israel captive. Even these young men, these teenagers, they were brought into King Nebuchadnezzar's court and they were castrated. That is what they did with men from other countries to make them slaves in the royal court of the king. They would castrate them. These young men were castrated as teens. They were made to understand that they were going to be servants to the king for the rest of their lives in a foreign country. Daniel and his three buddies had done nothing wrong, but the nation around them was in sin, and the judgment of God had fallen upon the nation of Israel. Now, these, three, these four boys will go on to prove that they would not bow down to godlessness. They wanted to prove that their way was a better way by not eating the king's food. They were ready to fight the good fight of their faith. Why? Because somewhere down the line in Israel, they were disciples of some godly men and women. And so therefore, when they went into the enemy territory, they proved themselves faithful. They went into the fiery furnace. They dealt with the lions. They dealt with persecution of, you're going to be killed if you don't fall down and worship the king. Nebuchadnezzar and all of this. These were men who were proven to be faithful. These were young boys who were put to a test at a teen age. They were put to the test over matters of life and death and God. Because the Bible may not say this, but I know, as a parent, I know, somebody was influencing them. Somebody had a part in their life. And we sit here sometimes and we scratch our heads and wonder why our kids are going the wrong way. Our kids are messing with ungodly things and we think everything is fine. Today, the temptation for this youth to fall is greater than ever before. With social media, with, with, with the, the generation today of, of such evil in, in TV and movies and secular music, it's there. And it's drawing them to a place of violence. It's drawing them to a place of, of perversion. You know, Adolf Hitler in World War II understood the importance of capturing the youth of his nation. 
He went after the youth. In his reign of terror, what, 10 plus years that he ruled? He went after the youth. He had all kinds of programs implemented towards capturing the minds of the youth. And evil today is going after the youth. And the church of Jesus Christ in America is doing nothing about it. If the church of Jesus Christ is saying nothing about the womb, the babies in the wombs being murdered, they're definitely not saying nothing about those kids that are out in, this, in society today. Killing themselves, shooting themselves, raping each other, murdering each other. This is the, food, the truth. This is what is happening. You know, the Lord put on my heart yesterday, and I just put it out there, very simple. Modesty pleases God. I was walking in the mall yesterday, my wife and I, and, I, and you know, you've seen it. This generation showing so much skin. Practically walking around almost naked. And where does this come from? The Bible teaches that God, that, that modesty pleases God. That God loves modesty and humility. Those are things that are required to walk with him. But yet our society is teaching to the people today, not just the youth, but the people to pervert your body. That you need, you need to do this and you need to do that and piercings here and, and, and ink there, tattoos there. And you know what? Before you change the channel, just please hear me out because I'm going to back up what I say. All of these things are distractions. They're distractions from them focusing in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, because look at the results that are out there in society today. The church is not doing its job. I'm here to say today, devil, you cannot have these kids. That's where you're supposed to say amen. Amen. Wake up, church. Devil, you cannot have these kids. Amen. I said, devil, you cannot have these kids. Amen. You'll be shouting amen if you know your kid was in danger of hellfire. This is as serious as it gets. We see the perversion in the schoolhouse today how teachers are abusing the relationship with their students. Every single day we hear of a story in America where this sexual abuse is happening in the schoolhouse. We see this, it's perversion. It's demonic. But for many it's just becoming the norm. Just like shootings. You know, we don't have a gun problem, we have a God problem. I said, we don't have a gun problem. We have a God problem because Cain picked up something and it wasn't a gun to kill his brother Abel. He had a God problem. This has been going on from the very beginning and Satan would want you to look at other things and say, it's, it's gun laws. It's this law we need to make. It's that law we need to make. No, no, when we need to go to Jesus, the one who fulfilled the law of God, who can save us. Grace Christian Center School is growing. Praise the Lord. And we need to look to the future about expanding and making room for the school as well as for the church. When we started the school in 2016, the Lord immediately put in my heart that this entire building would be a school. We have just finished our seventh year of school. We are now, by the grace of God, and his mercy going into our eighth year of school. And the Lord told me here within this past week, it's time. It's time. What is the time to do, Michael? Well, pay attention, listen. I'm going to tell you what it means. This building is going to be dedicated as a school of this entire, entire building. And so we need to build a church in the back. Oh, well, let's do it. But you see, 
there's so much more than just building a building. Because you see, the church is not a building. The church is us. And you see, God can build any kind of building. God can do anything. But you see, God wants to build you. Before we lay a brick on top of a brick, and before we do anything back there, He wants you, the church, the true church building, to be intact. Because what we're about to go through, church, not just Grace Christian Center, but every Bible-believing church in America, what we're about to go through requires you to be sold out for the kingdom of God. Lay aside your drink. Lay aside your smoke. Lay aside your cursing, your lying. Lay aside your falsehood. Lay aside the habitual lifestyle of sin or it will kill you. It will kill you. And Satan will rob you of the call that God has for you. And the youth, the generation, will suffer because of your disobedience. This is the word of the Lord. The, these, these children are watching us. Will we show them Jesus? Or will we show them the flesh? I know the Holy Spirit is speaking on many different levels right here in this moment. Those online, those in the sanctuary. You see, here's what we have to do. As we, as the church, our body, mind, body, and soul, as we do all that we can do, the Lord will take care of the rest. The Bible says, draw near unto him, and he shall draw near unto us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Amen? Does that what it says? Lay aside every hindrance, every sin that entangles us. Lay it aside, says the book of Romans. Amen? And so, as we do as much as we can do, the Spirit of God will take us the rest of the way. And when we get to that moment, we are called to leave the next generation an inheritance. Inheritance, I said. An inheritance. We need to leave them resources. We need to give them a head start in the good fight of faith. If the Lord tarries, the evil they will face will be much greater than what you and I face today. I promise you that. I promise you that. We have children in our school because their parents understand the dangers of the public school system. And those dangers are everywhere. And Grace Christian Center School is not perfect. And I hope parents understand that it is a great fight in this school, at Grace Christian Center School. Because the enemy is wanting to infiltrate what God has here. If the enemy infiltrates churches, the enemy is trying to infiltrate private Christian schools as well. And parents don't realize the tremendous fight that we have spiritually. And so I need parents to pray with us. I need parents to not argue and complain and, and, and just want to have their way and prove their way to be right. But hey, I want you to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to get the love of God in you and understand that we are called for such a time as this. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Jesus said, the world will know my disciples by the love they have for one another. Are you loving your brother and sister in Christ? Are you loving these kids? A lot of us like to look at the, the, the current situation and think that that is the way it's going to be forever. God looks at us and sees a mess and he sees the end result. We need to start looking at God, how God sees things. When you look at a situation and it's a mess, let God give you vision to see what God can do if you surrender those things to God and let God work in situations. This is where we are right now. We need to build a building. 
they sent me a, a, a form that said, well, your property, Michael, it's worth $1.1 million. And we could very easily go get a loan, be in debt, a million dollars, because the Lord dropped it in my heart. That is what it's going to take, a million dollars. When I heard that, I instantly thought, and I believe that the Lord made me think this, a million souls. Billy Graham was a young man. He went to a tent revival meeting out in the sticks. And he heard this man preach. And Billy Graham gave his life to the Lord. And Billy Graham went on to speak to millions and millions and millions and millions of people. Hallelujah. But where did it begin? It began in that little tent revival. If that minister, who most likely had to put that tent together himself, no air condition in North Carolina, hot out there, humid. If that preacher was not faithful to the call of God, Billy Graham may have never heard the gospel. And therefore, millions may have never heard the gospel either. And so when the Lord said it's going to cost a million dollars, the Lord immediately allowed me to hear a million souls. There could be one child, maybe several, that will come through this school as they become elders in the next generation, they may lead millions to the Lord. And guess what? You had a part in that. Why? Because you believed and you sacrificed blood, sweat, tears, prayer, money. You gave for things to be built. You understood that as a Christian, you have to give an inheritance to the next generation. A good parent leaves an inheritance. How much more as Christians leave an inheritance to our spiritual children. I look at Benjamin. I look at Bella. I look at all these little kids. I look at my grandson, David. My time here is limited. Your time is limited here. When I'm old and I die, a new senior pastor will come along at Grace Christian Center. But what did Michael leave on his watch? What did Michael do when he was the pastor? What did he leave to the next generation? What did he build as what Paul and Peter and all the other apostles and the rest of the millions in the church throughout the church history, as they built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, what did Michael build on the foundation of Jesus Christ? What did you build for an inheritance for this next generation? Because it is going to get darker and darker. But our children are going to have some things that we can give to them that will help them to fight the good fight of, fight of faith a little bit easier. Because you said no to the pleasures of this world and you said yes to the kingdom of God. You understood that as you give money, it's not about money. It's about obedience. It's about building. Look, I'm here. I'm 51. I'll be 51 years old tomorrow. I'm not going to be here much longer. If I stay in good, strong health, what, 70, 80 years old? That's it. That's not very far. My goodness, from zero to 51, it's gone by so fast. I really don't think I'm going to be here for another, for, until I'm 100 years old. So I understand that what we're doing now and what every pastor in America and every Christian in America needs to understand that they need to come alongside their local church, along their local ministry, their local elders and, and, and pastors. And we need to be united in the spirit of God for the love of Christ. And we need to be about the work of the Lord because work while it is daylight for the night will come when no one can work says the word of God. If you're holding on and holding on and bigger, building bigger barns for yourself, Jesus says it will all be taken away, you fool, in one night. Isn't that what Jesus said? You are foolish. We are called to sow the seed, to water the seed. And the Bible says, and it's God that makes it grow. A while back I was saying, if the state of Austin pay, uh, passes the bill for state dollars, tax dollars, it's going to bless the ministries and the churches because we're going to be able to do some things with this. And God corrected me to, uh, this several days ago. And God said, 
It's not tax dollars, son. It's me. I've always have, and I always will build my church. Woo! Amen. Amen. And I said, I'm sorry, Lord Jesus. Please forgive me. You are absolutely right, as always. So I don't care if tax dollars are, 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 are brought in for education. We don't need that. You know, we don't need tax dollars. We don't need religious freedoms as an American because the church in Rome didn't have it, did they? We don't need none of that stuff the world has to offer. We don't need anything. All we need is Jesus. That's all we need. All we need is the will of the Lord to be done. We have a limited time. My time will eventually end. A new senior pastor will come to GCC. But was I faithful on my watch? Were you faithful on your watch? Why? God is watching. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, says the book of Hebrews. Amen? They're watching what we do. All of heaven, the saints who have gone on to be with the Lord, they're watching what we do. I believe that. The, the, the eyes, the little ones here in America, the, the youth, they're watching what we do. And God is watching. We must be willing to give so that these kids can have an inheritance from their elders. Amen. And so here's what we must do. We must pray, sow, build, and pray. It's going to begin with prayer, it's going to be sustained by prayer, and it's going to end in prayer. Amen? You think, well, I don't have that much to give. Yeah, God knows that, but He's called you to give. Amen? Now, I want to read something to you. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 15. Paul says to the church in Corinth, I'm going to read out of the NLT version because it's a little broken down into easier English to understand. But compared to the NASB, the New King James, it doesn't lose its meaning. And so I'm just reading it to break it down a little bit easier. Okay? 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 15, it says this. Paul says, since you excel, he's speaking to the Christian, to the church. He says, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. You know, there is known as a ministry of giving. You know, and we all have that ministry. We're all called to be blessers. Amen. A Christian is one who blesses. Because if we're Christ-like, Jesus was a blesser. Jesus gave everything. For God so loved the world, God gave everything. And so if we're to follow in the steps of Christ, we are also blessers too. We have something to bless. What did Jesus tell the disciples? Go into the towns. If they reject you, wipe the dust off your feet as you leave that town. Remember? But what did he say? But if they receive you, they will receive what? They will receive a blessing. That home will receive a blessing. Amen? You are a blessing, Christian. No matter, and it's not about the money. Okay? Elijah didn't have anything. But he went into the widow's house and he said, uh, fill this up with water and, and all man the lady had oil she had flour and she had it and it sustained them in a famine there was no money so God is asking for obedience God is looking for people who will believe in him when all the world says it's impossible and I'm going to tell you something with God all things is possible a million dollars oh, please are you serious that's nothing that's not even a, a half a penny for God. In our eyes, it could be a great deal of money. But you see, we're not the one who's called to build. We're just called to sow and water the seed. We're called to be faithful with whatever we have. Now, Paul says here, I want to remind you to excel in this gracious act of giving. Verse 8, he says, I am not commanding you to do this. See, the New Testament doesn't command us to be givers. God says he loves a cheerful giver. Now, I want you to hear this because some of you, I'm going to just tell you this. I am not a prosperity preacher, but just hear me out. Some of you are broke because you don't give unto the Lord because the Lord just can't trust you with riches. And some of you are so rich, but yet you don't give to the Lord. 
And you have a day of reckoning coming. When you come to a place in your life where you understand that nothing is yours. Nothing. Not even the breath is yours. Nothing belongs to you, Christian. It belongs to God. So when you open up your checkbook, you say, God, how much do I give? When you come to a ministry to serve, you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Amen? Everything is about serving the Lord and about being a blesser. You see, look, look at your hands like this. God puts the blessing here, but if you do this, it can't flow, and you stop the flow of God blessing, not just you, but others in your life. You can't have the flow of God, the blessing of God flow like this. It has to be open. It's not about the money. It's about trusting in God. And as He blesses others, He blesses you. He'll meet your every need. Amen. Paul says, I'm not commanding you to do this. Look, verse 8. But I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. This was implemented in all the churches to be givers. Paul had told all the churches, Jerusalem needed help. The church in Jerusalem needed help. They were the ones who were on the front line battling this demonic attack against the church. And all the churches were to gather offerings to give to the disciples and to the Apostle Paul to bring back to Jerusalem to help those. Because you see, what you didn't understand is that in just a few years, Rome would come and conquer Jerusalem in AD 70. The church in Jerusalem was in really big trouble. And God knew that time was coming. And I believe most likely that Christians of the day, they knew that that was the hot spot of the world. And Paul was rallying them to give to the saints in Jerusalem. Help them. They're going through so much. Look, he says in verse 9, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. This is, just not, this is spiritually speaking, okay? It says here, here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Now he's speaking in the physical. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now, you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion, proportion to what you have now, I just want to remind you, the widow that Jesus saw, she gave all she had. She went above and beyond. She said, yes, God would just give what I have in proportion. She had two bits. She could have just gave one and said, that's in proportion of what I have. But she went above and beyond and she said, I'm going to give it all. And I believe that that's where some of you need to let God speak to you. Amen? Amen. Let God speak to you. And not just in giving of your finances, but giving in your time, in your talents, where you serve. Getting involved in the lives of, of other Christians and churches and helping them. It's not just talking about just giving of money, but in everything. But yes, it is, starts, mostly it starts with just giving of your livelihood. Look, Cain and Abel, remember them? Why did Cain kill Abel? because of giving to God. The devil will try and steal this from you, and he did with Cain. When you don't have a right heart about giving unto the Lord, you'll hate your brothers. You'll, you'll, you'll hate people because your heart's not right with God, and therefore you don't have the love of God in you. And that's why Cain killed his brother Abel. Now, but look at verse 12. Paul says, but whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. This is common sense, guys. Amen? I've seen where preachers abuse this and they'll say, everything you have in your bank account, give it to the Lord. He's going to bring it back 20 fold, 100 fold. You'll never hear me say that. That's not scriptural. But... 
in my life as a Christian, as a pastor in all these years, I have had people come to me and just say, Pastor, this is all that's in my bank account. And the Lord said to write this all to this church. And I looked at them like they were crazy. And you better be very sure if that's the Lord telling you that or if that's just your flesh. Because sometimes people put themselves in trouble. They weren't hearing the Lord correctly. In this situation, they did hear the Lord correctly. But you see, give to what God has put in your heart to give. If you continually give the same amount all the time, all the time, all the time, if that's what God has told you to give, then that's fine. But if God has been convicting you to give greater, you need to listen to this, because look what I'm about to read here in just a moment. Paul says here in verse 13, of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Church, is there equality between you and your brothers sisters and your brothers and sisters? Between your life and the need of your church? Is there equality there? We all need to look and help each other. You don't know what me and Anna have done to help others. And you don't need to know. And I don't need to know what you do, but God knows this stuff. Many times we've helped people pay their light bills, buy tires for their cars. Why? Because the Lord told us to do those things. Many times you've done that too because I've heard things you've done as well. And that's good. That's pleasing unto the Lord. But you see, the enemy wants us to hold on to what we have. And, and, and the world will tell you, hold on to what you have. Hold on to what you have. Right? Doesn't the world say that? The economy is not s secure. But thank God, our livelihood is not based on the economy of the world. It's based on the blessing on the kingdom of God. And we move according to the heartbeat of God, not to this world. And so while the world is saying, oh, this is a bad time to do this, this is a bad time to do that, we need to listen to the Lord. And the Lord is saying it's time to build. He may come tonight, He may come tomorrow, but were we faithful in the time that we, He had us here to do what we, He had called us to do? Verse 14 says, Right now you have plenty, and you can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty, and they can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. God wants us to be equal. Now, let me tell you about the abuse of this scripture. Socialists have taken this scripture and have abused this and say, you need to distribute the wealth. That's what socialists will say. They abuse that scripture. This is not what that is saying. This is talking about giving of your own free will. And in socialism, you don't give of your own free will. It's taken from you by force. You see the perversion of Scripture there? That's the perversion and the twisting of Scripture by men. But there should be equality, yes, but of your own free will. You've got to understand something. It began with free will, and it's going to end with free will. Adam had free will, and we are going to have free will to the very end. Why? Because God is not a master of puppets. God wants you to give according to what He has told you but you must act on faith and obedience to Him. And when you do that, there will be equality. And as I look at the generation that's coming up, I am a blessed man in every way. I am one of the richest men on the face of this earth. And I'm just talking about money. I'm talking about the blessings of the Lord. And so are you. And we need to be able to learn how to leave an inheritance to our spiritual children. We see in churches, people have funerals and people die. And they, you know, you may come up and say a couple of good things. And then that's it. The church service is over, the funeral is over, and then that's it. But what did they do? What kind of legacy did they live, leave behind? What kind of influence were they? What kind of building block were they? What did they leave? You know, you may leave a, a good life insurance policy for your spouse and children, but what about the children of God? What about your, the generations that are coming up? I look at people like David Wilkerson, Leonard Ravenhill. They sowed greatly. 
they bled greatly. Their sermons, their books to this day still bless me because it was rooted from the, the Spirit of God. And in this sense, we're talking about a school. We're talking about a school in this community. God has kicked the training wheels off of this school now. We've been on training wheels for seven years. And God has kicked the, the training wheels off. And God says, let's go. We are going into year eight. And you know what eight symbolizes in the Bible? Can anybody tell me? New beginnings. All this hit me this week. Within this past week. Oh Lord. Verse 15 says this. As the scriptures say, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. God knows what you need, when you need, and how you need it. Let me move on. 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 2. He says, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. I don't need to write about it, he says. Why? Because you all know the Holy Spirit has dealt with you on being a giver. Verse 2. Look, for I know how eager you are to help. Is the eagerness there to leave an inheritance for the next generation? Paul knew these people. He knew they were eager. He says, I know how eager you are to help. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to start sending an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. You hear that? That's infectious. When you understood what Jesus has done for you, he blessed you. That blessing's not for you, it's for others. There are pastors out there. They're building their own kingdoms. And those who know me, that is not who I am. I'm talking about building a school. About building a legacy in the lives of these kids. An inheritance. That's good that we're running out of room here. There is a reason why we have four acres in the back just sitting there. There's a reason for that. Over the years, I've had three people tell me, and the other two didn't even come to this church, and one of them does. They've had dreams along the same lines about seeing people back there, about tents in the back, people living back there, finding refuge there. The, how, the Word of God was in the back. And I've mentioned this over the years, these other two. It's time to build. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15 says this. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. See, that's what I am, that is what I'm talking about. Th th there's a principle to this. You sow little, you'll reap little. You sow great, you'll reap great. Look, God has always met my need and the, wife, the need of my wife. God has always met our need. And he always will because he's not a liar. But you see, we want to sow greater in our time, talent, and treasure. Anna and I, why? Because we see the kids coming up I see, I'm with these kids every single morning. I see the things they're struggling with in their mind and in their hearts. And that matters. And one day when they're 40, 50 years old, or the Lord tarries and they'll come, they're going to remember what that old Pastor Michael said. They're going to remember what their parents, their godly parents said. And not only that, but they're going to have a church family to fall back on. They're going to be able to send their kids to a private school here because we began to build when the Lord said to build, and it will be here. We'll long be gone, but the places will still be here. 
you must decide, verse 7 says, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, you must decide. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Amen? Remember Cain? He just gave just to say he, just to say he gave. And yet, it showed that he was not right with God. He was a giver, but he was not a right giver. And he was not right with God. Please don't fall into that trap. Don't give under pressure. Give because you're hearing the call of God and the urgency that's needed at Grace Christian Center to do what we are called to do. Churches. I pass by churches through Friendswood, Gulf area, Clear Lake. These churches are big churches. And their buildings are only open on Sundays and Wednesdays. While the YMCA and the bars and the clubs are open all the time. And yet these churches are only open two days a week. Shame, shame, shame. I believe every single church who has a big building like that should have a Christian school, period. There are enough Christian teachers that are leaving the public school system to utilize to get these ministries started. That is how you leave an inheritance. You, do you understand, pastors, that evil is going after the kids? You go after those kids. If not, get out of the pulpit. When it comes to these kids, I'm dead serious about this. These pastors are busy. These pastors are busy. They're so busy about doing their own things, their own kingdom. And so we need to focus. I know you hear a little kid there, right? Hear that kid's voice? Hear him? One day he's going to grow up. Praise God out of the mouth of babes. Amen? Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> he's leaving, walking out the door. He's got to go somewhere else. That's why he's leaving. Not because he don't like it here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> we churches have to hear this. And if your local church is doing something about this situation, support them. Support your local church. If your church is not doing this, talk to the pastors. And if they're just busy about just doing the church thing, you need to go to another church then. The church, the, the only day this church is, is closed, I mean, and it's not closed, it's just the only day this church building is not doing anything is a Saturday. This building is rocking and rolling all the time. Monday through Friday with school, Wednesday night services, Friday night services, Sunday morning services. This building is always going. You can look at the light bill. Wow. You think your light bill's big. Look at the light bill of this church. My goodness. <laughs> But God takes care of it. But I'm telling you, it's all worth it. It is worth it. God meets the need as long as we are willing to do what he has called us to do. Now, let's go back to the scripture. Verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over. Look, to share with others. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You can share with others. That's what we're called to do, share with others. Look, look, here's what I want you to do. Look how much time, talent, and treasure you spend on this and on that on that. One Christian man told me, man, I, I, I added up how much I spend at the convenience store every morning. He said it was 600 and something dollars every month of what he spent at the convenience store. And he wasn't talking about gas. 
he was talking about getting breakfast there, getting, you know, drinks for the day for his work and all that. He said the Lord convicted him of that. Some of us need to buckle down and re retighten on our finances. But God will always meet your need. We need to get smart about this, guys. We need to get smart. As the scripture says, verse 9, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. He'll bless you, but then you also got to follow through and be a blessing to others. You hear me? And that's the trap. A lot of Christians get blessed and then they keep it. No. You got to bless others. And you got to give above and beyond. I believe that because I've seen it. I've seen it. Now, a lot of people like to operate by the principle of tithe. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. The way I see scripture, the New Testament does not command us to tithe. But it is still a good principle to go off of. Let me just tell you this. I believe that tithing is just the training wheels to actual giving. In the Old Testament, that's what they did. They tithed. But when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the law. Jesus said, you was written that you shall not kill. But Jesus said, but if you just look at someone or you hate someone in your heart, it's just as if you killed them. And the same way it is with giving. You know, we were to, they were to give of the tithe, the law of Moses. But as Jesus came along and fulfilled it, we, a, a true believer gives more and greater than what a tithe would say. That's what I'm saying. But at the same time, you need to hear God on this. You need to hear God on this. Why am I talking about all of this? Because all of this is connected. Our, our love for the kids, leaving an inheritance, our giving, our not falling into a habitual lifestyle of sin, all of this is connected. If we're not faithful in all of these things, then we can hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. You get what I'm saying this morning? So, verse 10 says, I'm sorry, verse 11. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. The next generation will thank us to the glory of God because we were faithful and left them an inheritance, left them a place of worship, left them where uh, things that their kids could be blessed with. Now, it says here, going on to say, so two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. Amen. Paul was speaking in regards to the, the, time, the, the time of the day and that was to help Jerusalem. And today, Jerusalem's in all of our hearts. God sees us all worldwide as Christians all over the world. And every local church needs to meet the needs of that local community. And that is what we are called to do right here at Grace. That is what every church should do in their local community. And if every church would be faithful and do that, you would see a change in society. I believe that with all my heart. So it's not just about giving money. It's about being faithful to God in your time, in your talent, and in your treasure. It says here in verse 13, as a result of your ministry, you hear that? They will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers who will, will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for, your deep, for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. Amen? Amen. So we lay aside our grievances. Christians, we help each other. We understand that we are called to support our local church. Especially when God has given those churches a vision and the anointing which generally is geared towards fulfilling the Great Commission to win lost souls. The churches have many different ways to serve. Some are geared towards helping the homeless. 
Some are geared towards running food banks. Some are geared towards incredible missionary work. Some are geared towards having schools and universities and things like that. But I believe in this time right now that we're in, we see the, the root of this problem is this evil is geared towards the youth. And if the churches will understand that that is where the true fight is, we need to go after the youth. We need to go after them. And let me just close with this. This, build, this room right here, if the Lord is willing and, the Lord, and, the, and if the Lord tarries and doesn't come anytime soon, this building, this room right here that you're standing in, as we begin through the will and the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ, begin to build in the back. This, once that back is done, the, the, the new church building in the back is done, this will be converted into a room that will bless and house the youth, not only of the school, but even the youth that come here, the Grace Christian Center. We're going to take everything out, the chandeliers, the pews, the carpet. We're just going to leave the stage and the balcony. And this is going to become an indoor gymnasium for our youth, for the school youth, for the church youth. This is where they'll have their little rallies here. This is going to be an incredible place. It's going to be at the very front of the street because the youth come first. And God always designed it that way. This building was built in the 70s. This land was given by Dr. DeWitt in Alvin to a board of elders, Kings Row Baptist Church, with the intention of Christian education. Those pews that you're sitting on, there are name plaques on each one of those pews, basically. If not that side, the other side. And there are different names of different families. Each pew probably costs about $2,000. They're very expensive. And you can see there's 16 pews. When we first came in here, there was 20. We had to take out four of them because we needed a little bit more room. But we have 16 pews in here. And there are plaques, and we saved the other plaques of those pews. But I didn't, I've ne we've been in here since 2012. I've never taken these pews out, and I won't until we actually become this, until this place becomes a youth center, because these pews meant something to the families. These chandeliers, they will be in the other building because these chandeliers were given by families. They meant something to the families. And you don't just throw those things away. And we can't just throw the youth away. And God's allowed me to understand that, you know, people that pass things down, it's a blessing. This was, I mean, you may, all oh, these orange pews, yeah, they were in the 70s, they looked good. They were back in the day, right? And today we may look at them, oh, that's a weird color, but you know what? They're blessing us today. They're comfortable, aren't they? Because they understood what it meant then to leave an inheritance for you today. And you got to get that too. We need to leave an inheritance. Amen? Amen. I hope you understand and I hope you receive this.